Welcome to the Swim Swim Breakdown. As always, I'm Coleman Hodges coming to you from Austin, Texas. We are joined by Swim Swam Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And joining us today for the first time on the breakdown is Swim Swam contributor Yin Yin Lee coming to us from Madison, New Jersey. What's we up, got everybody? a rookie. Are we going to haze her, Coleman, or are we just going to let her be? <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sure there'll be some hazing opportunities throughout this conversation but no he's bad hang of it. coleman i don't know why you're setting such a terrible example for all of the young impressionable swimmers who are watching this <laughs> no hazing yes hazing maybe hazing <clears throat> anyway let's get into some swimming discussion we had we've we've got a lot on the plate first off Simone Manuel to ASU. This seems like old news almost at this point, but this was the biggest story uh, of of the week for sure. Um, first of all, I'm just curious, pure speculation here. Why do you think of of all the places she could have gone, Simone chose to hop on the bandwagon with everyone else and go to ASU to train with Bob Bowman? You know, I think people overestimate how many places there are for a swimmer like her. I mean, there's maybe five places in the country that are even in the conversation. She could go to NC state. She could go to Tennessee, Florida, Arizona state, or somewhere like off the wall. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. And that's why I said five and only nine named four, but like, there's, no, there's just not like, I think some people get in their heads that there's 20 options and there's really not that many, you know, from what I understand, she and um, Chase Kalish and Reagan Smith, who are also going to Arizona state are kind of, like buddies on national team trips and they get along. Um, so I'm not saying there was, you know, this is a LeBron James, Dwayne Wade sort of deal where they all agreed to go to the same team at the same time. But, you know, it based on what she went through, I'm sure she wants to go where she's comfortable, um, where she likes the people, where she gets along with the people. Um, and what we know about Arizona State and Bob Bowman, what we know about Simone, both in the pool and outside of the pool, it just feels like it's probably where she's most comfortable, which sounds vague and generic, but is maybe not always as obvious as it seems. Yeah. Another thing that I was looking at is um, she's from Texas. So Arizona State would be like relatively closer to home than a lot of the other big pro group spots. And as Braden was saying, there's not that many pro groups for postgrads that are not alumni of the colleges. And really, like, if you look at the two biggest pro groups, it's just Florida and Arizona State. And I think Arizona State, like, I think is still a little bit smaller than Florida. And maybe she wants more individualized attention. And it's also closer to where she's from, which is Texas. And I think that's a might be a big part of why she came to ASU. You know, it feels like it's closer, um, but it's actually a thousand miles away because Texas is gigantic and she's from Houston. I'm trying to see how far Knoxville is. Knoxville is actually closer to Houston than Arizona, believe it or not. Um, but it is a more similar climate, maybe. It's hot. <laughs> and uh, probably probably a quicker travel time, like flying from Phoenix to Houston. I'm sure it's yeah. super easy, you yeah. know, flight-wise. Um, lots of direct flights. I am. It is curious because we saw on social media that at one point, kind of during last winter, she was tr may have been training at Tennessee in some capacity. Whether that was just for a couple weeks, you know, we don't really know. But um, it's kind of interesting that it, that would have been a landing spot that I would have seen for her. But she, you know, now she's going to ASU. So obviously, whatever that that wasn't the the long-term fit for her. Um, I, I think Tennessee would have made sense because, you know, everybody you talk to in the sport knows that Matt Credit is a place to go for swimmers when they're, oh, how do I say this? I don't want to sound like condescending about it, but like when they need sort of, they need like an emotional reset. They need a coach who, who they feel like really cares about them as a person. Like that's Matt Credit's bread and butter. And we've seen him get a lot of transfers for those reasons um and i think for that reason it makes sense that she would have a stop there right like matt credit probably from day one was um, you know i don't want to say father figure because she's got a dad that does his job just fine but like it you know I, i'm sure he provided her what she needed for some time and some confidence and some support that way but i think i think at the end of the day simone is a 
is a huge star and probably wanted to be around other huge stars to some degree. Right. Like I think it just sort of made sense from her, from a mentality standpoint to be with bigger stars than they have at Tennessee. Tennessee has some good swimmers, but they don't have Chase Kalish and Reagan Smith and Olivia Smoliga and that kind of caliber of swimmer. So we go ahead. Uh, Yeah. uh, I was going to say, um, yeah, also, I think, like, the number of sprinters at ASU may have played a part in her decision. I think she's definitely the most high-profile one out of maybe her, Olivia Smaliga, and Ryan Held, but it's definitely a better place to be than some of the other options. And I was actually reading um, some of the comments on um, our article about Simone Manuel going to ASU, and Rachel stratton Millis, one of the assistant coaches at um, – Arizona State worked with Leah Neal, who's also a sprinter um, at Asphalt Green um, in New York for a while. And sh- I think she sort of developed Leah Neal and Leah Neal and Simone Manuel um, both went to Stanford for college. And I guess like there could be a connection there as well. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that, but could be a connection. Uh, she, she's at ASU. In terms of Simone being a big star, I am curious the impact you think she could have on her return to potential return to the national team, to the world and Olympic stage. So we'll start the show right off. Yin Yin, here's your hazing. Sink or swim, Simone is the missing piece that Team US needs to move past the Australian women in the 400 free relay. This okay, I think, this question. I think I'm <laughs> relatively prepared for this hazing because I actually, when Simone announced that she was going to ASU, I actually added up um, the fastest splits. Well, I did Simone Manuel's flat start time of 52.04, and then Tori Husk was 52.7, Claire Curzan 52.62, and Abby Weitzel went 52.49 in Tokyo. So when I added those up, I got 3.29. 85, which is just two tenths off the Australian world record. So I think obviously I don't think they're all going to peak at the same time and go that time. And I'm not really sure if Simone's going to get back to 52.0 form that quickly. But I think it just shows that like American sprinting like is closer to the Aussies than it seems. And I do think I do think the relay is going to be a lot better than it was before. And like, I'm thinking like, when have we seen four different Americans like being capable of like splitting 52 all at the same time? Like, have we ever had that happen before? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would not have thought our, the, the, the top when, four. When did Mallory out, broke, break the American record? It I think wasn't... 2017, 2017, yeah. I think they had like some trials and in India. And- um Comerford I think they split 52 in 2017 and mm-hmm. Ledecky and Weitzel split 52 in 2016 but Ledecky didn't do that in 2017 and yeah. I don't think Weitzel made the world's team in 2017 I don't remember she only made it in the 50 free yeah. not in the relay yeah well union hedged um and that's just not my style I don't think it's I mean it's so it sort of speaks to where the U.S is that we're all still thinking that Simone's not only going to get a relay spot but maybe an individual spot um, coming back out of this but like I just think the Australians are going to be even better I think by Paris the Australians will be a 328 um, and even if the Americans all hit their stride at the right moment I just don't think it's going to be enough to matter you look at like Molly O'Callaghan and what she's doing I think Kate Campbell probably still has a 52 low in her if she comes back and trains. Emma McEwen is obviously a stud. Maybe Kaylee McEwen will pick up the 100 free. It doesn't matter. They've got like 3,000 swimmers who can all go 52s, and they just need to pick the right four to go 51s, and they're going to go something untouchable. So the speaking of which, the live results – um, for the Australian team at Junior Pan Packs in the mixed 400 medley relay last night were a little, like, obviously not correct because they have the first leg splitting 113 and the second leg splitting 48. But it seems like the last two splits who were women, I'm guessing, were accurate. So Jesse Coleman was 
Well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe not. Jesse Coleman was 55-3 on the fly leg. Hannah Casey, 52-67 on the free leg, which if that is correct, that's another 52 split that Australia has to work with, which is just like, yeah, it as Braden said, mind. Mind bottling. It bottles the mind. It bottles the mind. <laughs> Are we sure that 52-6, right? Because it says I'm, she I'm opened, not. It no. says she opened in 23-4, which means she closed in 29-1, which is also a no, little bit suspicious. Right. So I don't yeah, I I I'm not sure that could be wrong. I'm just going by live results. I'm hoping a race video will come out that we can uh, poke around on <laughs> some hand timing. Yeah. I think so, the video is there, like on the stream. It doesn't look great for US women, but Simone is uh, giving us some hope moving forward. Um, the next, the next piece of huge news is that Cal is combining their programs temporarily. Question um, mark. At least for the time being, Dave Durden is the acting director of aquatics for Cal. He will be. I, I guess that means he's the head coach of the men and the women. Matt Bow will be the associate for the men. David Marsh will come back and be the associate for the women. Um, and the question is, can Cal maintain its excellence on the men's side and you know keep that top two streak at NCAA's going while buoying or lifting up the women's team as well? I see what you did there, buoy. In. that's what he used to think he pronounced his name as um you know if you like obviously what's what happened at cal over the summer is not a good situation but as i texted coach jordan this morning if you find yourself in this situation and you can roll out dave durden and dave marsh to take that over and uh figure out how to move forward like that's about as good as it gets um, in this kind of a scenario, you know. I think I think uh, I think Durden is going to have sort of oversight of Marsh and what's going on there, but I think they. My sense is, my intuition is that Durden will still be largely just focused on the men's team, um, with Matt Bow and and then everybody else will kind of come together to work on the women's team, and they'll have some flexibility and some crossover, and he'll send some of his sprinters to work with Marsh and whatever, whatever. I, I don't see how this hurts the Cal men's team. I, you know, I just, I think these are two out, I three outstanding coaches, right? Like Matt Bow is a fantastic coach. Dave Durden is a fantastic jo- coach. Dave Marsh has accomplished uh, almost as much as any college coach ever. Um, Jesse Moore was a collegiate head coach. Um, I think the the jury's still out on how he's going to be at this super elite level as a coach, but he was a collegiate head coach, right? So he can do paperwork. He can, he, you know, they've got four coaches on this staff who can basically handle their own business when they need to. Um, and that, that gives me confidence that this can work. Um, I don't think they had, I certainly don't think they had a better choice. Um, so I see, I see why they did it, even with the risks to the men's team. Um, but I, I have no reason to believe it won't work out. Yeah, I agree with Brayden. He basically said all that I wanted to say, but um, I think it's gonna work out because he has that assistant coach support system, and like Marsh, I think Marsh and um, Moore are they the two like women's assistants? I believe they are, and. More Wait. is uh, is being called men's and women's. So that means he and whoever the fifth assistant they bring in will will be floaters who will go back and forth. Yeah. So as I was saying, like Marsh and Moore were both former head coaches and um and they're also getting another assistant. So I think, yeah, like as Braden said, D- Dave Durden is gonna be able to focus on the men while mainly relying on um his assistance for the women's team while like being able to like take on that role as head coach for both teams you know my favorite rumor on this is that kim bracken will return and join the the cal staff and it'll basically be auburn all over again i was i was gonna bring that up and i (laughs) i love that rumor as well that would be wild we saw kim bracken as an assistant on the la current when marsh was the head coach um, in ISL. <clears throat> and so we know that they have a, a good working relationship a, as far as coaching goes. So that would, that would be pretty 
crazy. Well, the, and the pyramid's kind of inverted, right? Because I, I have to assume that Durden would have been the bottom of that totem pole at Auburn. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking that, yeah, Bracken was kind of this associate and kind of ran the women's team, more or less. What about Cindy Gallagher? I'm trying to think of what other female coaches. I assume it's going to be a female. Um, and I'm trying to think of who would be available at this point. And I could mm-hmm. see Cindy Gallagher saying, yeah, I'll do a year. She's familiar with the Pac-12. She lives in California. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, it the, So the idea of... I think Durden will have a more hands-on role with the women just because what we've seen from Marsh in the past is that he's really good when he just gets to coach. But, you know, at UCSD, he was kind of running his pro group and then also doing the college team. And I think the college team ultimately got a little neglected. Um, And so while I think Marsh will be really effective in this role, I do think Durden will kind of be the overseer of both um, and and be hands-on with both just because with Marsh having a little more control, I, I don't, I don't know. That might go really well, but it what also does hands-on mean, it does it mean travel and meet schedules and administrative duties. Or are you thinking that Durden's going to be on deck working with Izzy Ivy and, I think I think it's going to be like a combined program where the men and women are practicing together. I just don't see why it wouldn't be if that's how they're running things, because that was absolutely not the case when Terry was there. Like Terry and Durden were completely separated, separate or like if they're ever overlapping practice times, like they were not doing well, the they same have different thing. pools, right? They practiced at different pools. They had, I th- they have two pools. Yeah, I think um, the certainly. men practiced at the new one and the women practiced at the old one was was my understanding. You would know better than me gotcha. for people who don't know Coleman's brother was training at Cal for a while. I kn- when he was there which was a few like kind of right when the new pool was built, um they would practice in it sometimes and then they'd go to the older one sometimes too. Um but I I don't see why they wouldn't just combine and and have uh, mixed gendered practices, but I don't know. I'm uh, maybe I do one have, day Dave will tell us. I do have a practice and pancakes on the uh, booked for October do you with really? Cal Aquatics. Wow. I do. I wasn't sure they were going to let anybody <laughs> within a hundred yards of that pool this year. So, yeah, I'm so, surprised uh, that they're even letting you on campus. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> they're they're usually uh, yeah. So we'll Coleman, see. Coleman blends in well in Berkeley. He could sneak into that pool and nobody would question it. He's it's the, it's true. And I've, I've done it before. Oh, <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on from Berkeley, David Johnston uh, surprised us with an, an American record in the 800 f- short course meters freestyle, uh, which he, he had really good swims at Duel in the Pool. He had great swims at Nationals this summer. Great swims at NCAAs. I mean, he's had a nice trajectory since arriving at Texas. And uh, the the whispers on the Texas team is like, oh, yeah, kind of watch out for David. He, he's he's on the rise, but now he's kind of made that public in terms of <laughs> he's here. Um, so with the departures of Bobby Fink, Kieran Smith, and Matt Sates, all defending <laughs> NCAA champions in one event or another, or I guess prior into uh, NCAA yeah. champions and the freestyle events. Now we've got David Johnson. We've got Luke Hobson, who just dropped a 145 at Duel in the Pool. We've got incoming freshman and Olympic champion in the 400 free, uh, Ahmed Afnawi. We've got Jake McGahey, who's also an NCAA champion in mid distance. Who do you guys like in, in this field of men's mid distance freestyle heading into this NCAA season? I like how smoothly you pronounced Afnawi. Um, yeah. obviously you've taken our, <laughs> our roasting to heart over the years <laughs> the little practice. Yeah. You know, first thing I think we need to acknowledge is like Eddie Reese, his, his final act. If he ever retires, like all of a sudden Eddie Reese now has the best distance program in the country. And it, it kind of felt like he was just sort of preparing the program to hand it off to Wyatt and blah, blah, blah. And now it's, he's coaching American record holders and new events again. So I think that's super cool. Um, 
My sense is that Jake McGay, he's going to come back with a vengeance this season. Um, I don't think we knew about this throughout the year, but I've heard through the grapevine that he was dealing with some health problems last year um, that maybe weren't weren't publicized, but were impacting his performance. And he's got so much talent. Um, I think uh, Afnawi is going to, I think he's going to take a year to adjust to yard swimming just his stroke to me is a long course stroke. And so I think he's going to take some time to adapt to, you know, the intensity of Indiana training and their practices and Ray lose it. It's an intense environment. And we've seen swimmers in the past coming from, um, you know, even very talented swimmers coming from smaller club programs, having trouble adjusting to the intensity at Indiana. And he is used to sort of, being the guy right like he doesn't have a lot of high level intense swimmers to train with in tunisia um so i just think all of that is going to take some adaptation and then it's going to be these these kind of I, I think of them as the three young trio even though they're not that young anymore um and i just i think mcgay he is going to be the guy i just think he's super talented and these other guys are super talented too Texas hasn't necessarily been perfect at, in their NCAA tapers lately, so that plays into it. There is some unknown because Georgia is undergoing a coaching change, so I think we can't totally discount that. But let's feel good about McGahee. Yeah. Um. What I find interesting about Hafnau is even though he's the Olympic champion in the long course 400 at short course Worlds, he actually missed the finals in the 403 but then went 1410 in the 1500 which is the fifth fastest all time and so i think if he were to um just go to ncaa's and swim short course i think he would be better in the mile than the 500 and i think like if he ends up adjusting well i think he could be a favorite in the mile but in the 500 uh i think either mcgahey or luke hobson because they both had really good summers this year and McGay, he's been 406 before. Um, Hobson broke the national age group record three, three different times last year, and I think both of them look really good for the 500. Yeah, I'm 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 leaning towards Texas because of what you guys have said. Jake McGay, he um, looks looks great, and I think he'll probably have a bounce back year. He talked about how training with Matt Sates kind of gave him a kick in the butt because he was the top dog his first year. He won an NCAA title. And then when Matt Sates came in, he was like, whoa, I'm getting my butt kicked to practice. What's happening here? Um, but the the coaching change is just kind of a question mark. We don't, we don't know how that's going to change the landscape at Georgia, even though <clears throat> both, both head coaches were products of Georgia and have been coaching under Jack for a long time now. And then half now, I agree, probably might take a year to adjust. I'm not super convinced that he, you know, just how he's going to do. We've seen him with his gold medal race and we've seen him with that mile at short course worlds. But other than that, we've barely seen him compete, let alone put up those top caliber times. We um, often but, hear hear people say like the 200 yard free is like the 100 meter free, um, you know, in in terms of energy systems and technical mumbo jumbo whatever. Um, I wonder if there's something to like a 400 long course free is more similar to a 800 or 1500 short course freestyle. Which I wouldn't know the answer to, yeah. but that is a great question. <laughs> One that we're not going to answer today. Michael or somebody who coaches swimmers on the podcast. <laughs> Have now we like coming like this fall? I didn't see him in the like the picture of the Indiana freshman. Like he wasn't in that picture. So Ooh, maybe he's just a late arrival. Yeah. Yeah. I, he was scheduled to arrive this fall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what I thought. Hmm. But. Hmm. For for people who don't Good know, Union is like our expert at watching social media and <laughs> coming up with things like, hmm, this new superstar recruit wasn't in the team picture. I wonder what that means. <laughs> Very mm. What's happening in Bloomington? Duel in the pool. <clears throat> it happened. And the U.S. won by a significant margin, which I don't think anyone predicted. I even said that the U.S. would win but I was thinking it would be like by a very slim margin. And that was kind of more just me being optimistic as I am a lot, 
But first of all, did this format work for you? Whether you watched it or you just read the results, it was a wild format. There were a lot of of nuanced events and there was skins races, there was mixed relays, there was all kinds of stuff, mystery IMs, basically any weird event anyone has ever tried, they did it. Uh, did you like it? 75 with fins. There was no 75 with fins. Um, that was the biggest complaint. Can't do it in a long course pool. Uh, you know, I uh, I did. I liked a lot of it. I get the impression from people who organized it and, and trying to get information out of them that they want us all to just kind of squint and say, yeah, that was fun. And then like not think too hard about it. And so like, if that's all it's meant to be, then yeah, it was great fun. Um, I think, I think there's room in the schedule for this kind of a fun, less serious event. I still think it could be improved without losing that goal. Um, I think they could do better promotion of it. I think they could, you know, fine tune some of the events, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you know, for what it was, I think it was fun. I still love the idea of the old duel in the pools. Um, you know, the, the studs showed up for the old duel in the pool because it was important. It was meaningful. Caleb Dressel and Katie Ledecky are only going to show up to this meet if it gets huge TV ratings and Toyota backs a dump truck full of money up to their front door. Like that's, that's the only way you're going to see Katie Ledecky show up to do a two by 200 free relay. Um, so like it's. It is what it is. It's a good opportunity for the swimmers who went to get some publicity. Um, you know, it was fun. It almost like wasn't a swim meet, but like it was fun for what it was. My personal opinion on doing the poll is that it was good idea, mediocre execution. <laughs> You because, might be being generous with me. <laughs> yeah, because like the I, the events were really fun. Like part of like. I was on vacation while the poll was happening, so I wasn't even planning on like helping covering it. But then I saw like the events. I was like, oh, maybe this could be fun. And the events were fun. But like I think the scoring and the whole like lack of live results made following the meet a little more difficult. And I know and I sw spoke to Swimming Australia about this. They said they wanted the meet to be less focused on times, but I just think like just to a swimming audience, like times are so important and you can't just say like, oh, we're getting rid of times because we want to like make people forget about them. Like that's just not going to work. Well, the and ISL tried that. Um, so I was in the, the room when they, were, yeah, when they were scoping out the ISL and they were adamant that that was the future of swimming. And everybody was like, no, that's dumb. And you can see that every year the ISL adds a few more times back to the the mix. So and I think there's different ways to do times. Um, I, you know, I think I was watching the track and field world championships and they showed the winner's time and then how far back the next person was. So they, they showed them in like, you know, minus two tenths, minus four tenths, rather than showing exact times for every person. And I think that's kind of a nice compromise between, you know, the average person knows kind of can kind of figure out what that means over the course of a night but it's not as technical as just showing everybody's times, which can be a numbers blur. Um, I was going to say, like, has has do you know if track and field has ever tried anything outside the box like that? Or if like they've ever tried getting rid of times, which I highly um, doubt. Track and yeah. field kind of naturally has more outside of the box stuff, you know, like the steeplechase. I'm sure started as an outside of the box event. Um, they yeah, have, you know, they have more, decathlon, yeah, another one. They have mm -hmm. more relay meets, um, you know, track and field. Everybody gives swimming a hard time for metal inflation, but track and field already has a lot more events. So, you know, track and field, uh, our, our stat guy, our stat guru, Barry Revson has a favorite track and field event. And it's, uh, I forget the exact details of it. And it's not something they do at the world championships, but you basically, it's like a, a distance race that every 200 meters, somebody gets eliminated from the field. It's like an eliminator mile. So you can't just coast and kick late. You've got to be aggressive going out. Um, and he was proposing that ISL do that with the 800 free, which I thought would be really fun. You know, just like a big claw goes into the pool and pulls him out. Um, <laughs> that's what it looks like in my head, even though 
I understand that they're human beings and not stuffed toys in a box. Um, but, you know, track and field, I think, already has kind of funny events baked in and they don't have to do come up with funny events. Yeah. And plus all the field events are like really unconventional where swimming, it's just like back and forth down a pool. I, w- um, I would have liked to have seen a fins race. That's like the one thing they were missing. Just like a like a proper fin swimming race to see how close they can get to a world record. Yeah, fin. like the world, like the world universe, not world, the world games. World I think games that's what it's Birmingham. called. They had they were in Birmingham. They had fin swimming as one of the competitions. Yeah. Truly, what we're missing in swimming right now. Next up. We are one day into the 2022 Junior Pan Packs, but we already saw a myriad of meet records go down of big swims from the U.S., Japan, and Australia. Oh, and Canada. From everyone. Lots of big swims uh, down in Hawaii. What was your biggest takeaway from day one in uh, in Honolulu? God, there were so many takeaways. Daniel Deal is an animal. Maximus Williamson is an animal. Uh, Maggie Wanizek is an animal. Aaron Gemmel. Aaron Gemmel <laughs> is an animal. Animal. <laughs> the future is bright for American swimming. Um, and, and they're doing it in like not great conditions. It's not a great pool. I think I wasn't watching, but I think somebody told me that there were no wedges on the blocks. Is that true? What? <laughs> um, I don't know. I apologize if that's made up. Um, you know, I, I love how fast it is. It's like every time we think we get to the end of the fast swimming for this summer, just more stupid things happen. Um, I think during prelims overnight, Spencer had to write like six record slash ranking articles, which is just way too. That was finals. Finals were 11. Finals. You're right. Um, So reaching beyond the obvious, I think it's worth pointing out Lily Daly, who's a Canadian swimmer. Um, she finished sixth in the 200 free. She was 2005 in prelims, 2008 in finals. Um, she looks incredibly strong in the water. I honestly, watching her, it felt more like a 158, 159 kind of swim. Um, so besides the obvious, I'd keep an eye out for for Lily Daly, maybe kind of hopping in on this next generation of Canadian female swimmers. Yeah, um, I have an obvious takeaway and a not so obvious takeaway. The obvious takeaway, I think Erin Gemmel, she went once to 56 in prelims and finals. And I think that's like proving that she's a consistent 156 swimmer. And I think she's in good shape to um, take that second spot at trials behind Katie Ledecky next year and that she belongs on a senior international team. I saw some comments about how maybe she was I think she was sick before trials, which is why she added, whereas she was a lot better at other meets. But I think this meet definitely cemented her status as a top 200 freestyler. Um, My second um, smaller takeaway was, I actually wrote about this this morning, but it's about Canadian sw- swimmer Adam Wu. Um, He dropped three seconds in the 200 free. He went from 151.12 to... 148.26 in a day and he's headed to Colombia um to swim for them this fall and his I think his converted time would have um been second at Ivy's and it would have broken the team record there so I thought that was pretty cool and it's a pretty big deal for a school like Columbia I saw an, I saw an old Princeton guy claiming that nobody will ever interfere with Harvard Yale Princeton at the top of the Ivy League and I don't buy that. I think Columbia is a super desirable school. Like his premise was that nobody's going to pass up Harvard, Yale, Princeton for Columbia, just in general terms. And, you know, we have a Princeton alum on our staff and I think she'd agree with that. And that's what makes Ivy League alumni special is they believe those kind of things. Um But like, to me, I think the next generation of athletes is going to love the idea of living and training and going to school in new york city like i think that's going to become a huge draw for the next generation of swimmers so maybe this is the front edge of it yeah and adam Wu isn't like the only good like international swimmer at um 
Colombia. I think they had an NCAA qualifier. I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. It's Demirkin Demir. Um, it's okay. He, we don't have to pronounce yeah, names correctly yeah. in this podcast. Um, I never do. Yeah, he took bronze at European Juniors in 2019. He goes 1-0-0 in the 100 breast long course, 51-9 short course. And I think if Wu and Demir, like, if they can form that core for Colombia, I think they're really going up, only going up from here. Hey, pro tip, the faster you say the name, the more accurate it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Learn from the best, Yin Yin. Uh, well, I, I am less optimistic about this about Braden's argument of Columbia being able to crack into those. I haven't been to Yale's pool and I don't know a lot about their program. So I'm guessing that would might be the weak link that Columbia might be able to leapfrog over. But in terms of Harvard and Princeton compared to Columbia, like I got to go to all three of their campuses this past fall and like their facilities are just he- like head and shoulders above Columbia. Um, they're, they're, their teams are already built and like have really solid foundations and Columbia, like you guys said, are getting some good athletes, but I don't think they could compare. I don't think they could compete in the next five years with either of those teams. Um, even if they like recruited their butts off new, I think, I think younger swimmers will be more intrigued at going to somewhere like New York versus uh, Cambridge or, Princeton <laughs> or Just college. Thinking like college 10 times more generous. <laughs> right. Um, but I think for a swimmer who is obviously academically inclined, if you're going to an Ivy league school, but also wants to maximize their swimming potential. I do think I, I can't speak from what I've seen that like Princeton and Harvard are, are going to get eight or nine out of 10 of those athletes, I think. But which one of those schools has produced an Olympian in the last decade, a U.S. Olympian in the last decade? Columbia. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Katie Miley. Yeah. So. <clears throat> That's true. But they they weren't they weren't, you know, winning Ivies with Katie Miley. Yeah. <clears throat> That's how I'd recruit. <laughs> I mean, that's how they've got, I assume, but that's also their separate program. So the men, the men's team can't really claim Katie Miley. Anywho, that's our news for the week. Now it's time to play our favorite game, Sink or Swim. God, I love this game. First up today on Sink or Swim, Kieran Smith announced that he will not be returning to the NCAA and will be going pro. He also discussed with our very own Melvin Stewart, gold medal Mel, that he is shooting for the 400 free relay on Team USA. He said it's going to take a 47 plus to make that team in 2024. Do you see Kieran breaking through in the 100 free to qualify for the Paris foreign free relay. I'm going to do a soft sink because <laughs> like, I think if he really tried, he could, his best time is 48, five and he's dropped. He went 49, one in 2019. So he's dropped half a second in three years. And if like works and focuses more towards the 100 free, maybe, but I just think, men's 100 freestyle is just extremely competitive like there's so many like rising like 48 point like 48 low swimmers that like are all going to be competing for those relay spots and I'm just like not sure if he has what it takes to like get to that next level great oh sorry I'm used to going first so I don't know how to go second um (laughs) Did you know that our Mel Stewart is not like the most famous Mel Stewart in the world? I always think that's kind of funny. Really? Um, is there another Mel Stewart? Uh, yeah, know. one of the Henry Jefferson from the Jeffersons was Mel Stewart. Um, yeah, I'm looking up Mel Stewart is, right is now. Milton, He's an actor. He goes by Mel. Yeah, I'm looking up his Wikipedia page right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So anyway, um. Also, the guy who directed the original. Uh, Willy Wonka movie was named Mel Stewart, but he spelled it differently. I Google Mel's name a lot, so I know all of these things. <laughs> um, I am going to swim it 
because we got to remember Kieran Smith came out of high school as a backstroker. Um, so I think to pigeonhole him at what is he 22 years old, 21 years old, I think that would be a mistake. Um, and he's already been 48, 50. I think he's got a 47, seven in him. Um, I think he's that good. And I think the 400 free is terrible and that's why Americans never train for it long term. So I understand why he's training for the hundred free instead. Uh, and I think he's going to do it. Well, I'm, I'm sinking it for why Braden swam it. The 400 free is terrible, but I think there's an absolute opportunity there. And I don't think Kieran will pass it up. He's already the there's Olympic bronze. Opportunity, but is there a medal opportunity? I think the 400 free between now and Paris is going to get real fast, like real fast, like 341 high to medal. And I hope that's the case. I hope David Popovich starts swimming it <laughs> and just blows everyone away. But I do think that people are finally catching up in that event. And so maybe we'll get a taste for it next summer and then Kieran will shift his focus. But as the defending Olympic bronze medalist, where he knows he has room to improve there, I think he, he will keep that as the focus of his training and therefore he could probably still throw down a really good hundred free, but I don't think it's going to be enough to get him top six in that a final in trials. You know yeah. what I think? I think that you you're think? both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you swam it, Braden. <clears throat> uh, another big Florida men's news, Josh Leendo just surprise committed to Florida or not even committed. He's like, uh, Hey, Hey everyone, I'm going to Florida this fall. <laughs> Didn't didn't even make a commit post, just made a see a Canada post, essentially, uh, <laughs> which which was very surprising. Braden, you wrote a really interesting article about the, Josh Leendo's potential on the Florida team and how they could maybe break the 200 free relay NCAA record, which has stood since 2009, since the Super Suit era, 114.08. You, you have to average... 1852 to tie that record what <laughs> uh so yeah. so sink or swim they will break that record this year oh with swim the they're gonna push Lando. this record uh you know that those projections were like with a conservative josh leando swims the same times as brooks curry kind of estimate and i think josh leando is a faster sprinter than brooks curry in either long course or short course um, so like, I think, you know, what does smush mean in, uh, in a 200 free relay, like quarter of a second, I think they could take a quarter of a second off that record. Um, Florida shows up for NCAAs. They win SCC's cruising. They've got so much momentum. We can't, we can't overvalue momentum in college swimming, especially, um, you know, if Caleb decides he wants to train again and gets in the water, then they have Caleb Dressel to train with even better. But like, I just think they're going to, they're going to make that record look slow. I think it's going to be like, I think it's going to be at like Josh Leando's chest when he touches the wall. I think that's where the record line is going to be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to swim this as well. I was looking at Braden's article <clears throat> and, um, so with, from last year's relay, Will Davis and Kieran Smith, their fastest splits add up to 36.87. And McGuire McDuff, who went 18-6 at SECs, um, plus Josh Leando using the hypothetical conservative split, that adds up to 37.25. But I do think Leando is going to be a lot faster than 18.5 on a relay. He's a great short course swimmer. And I just feel like I just feel like 185 is like not fast enough for like his standards. And I think like even like a conservative estimating, like if they're like that close, I think um they're gonna be able to break it. My favorite part about this article is Braden's phrasing of here's some back of the napkin math. <laughs> Uh, did Florida really go 114.11 to win NCAAs? Yeah, I think yeah. So. they were real close <laughs> to that record. It Three was kind 100s. Of, it was kind yeah. of ignored because like they didn't have anybody contending for the 50 free title, so everybody sort of missed it. 
Dang. Okay. Well, I was going to sink this, but I mean, that that's Coleman, just how foolish. Can you, how can you sink it when you're replacing <laughs> Kieran Smith, who you just said can't be a sprinter, with Josh Leendo? Like, how can you not I can't. see that replacement as being able to drop three one hundredths of a second? I can't. I was going to sink it and say they were going to go one fourteen oh nine, but yeah, I mean, this is this is a no brainer. Uh, I th- yeah, they they're going to break it. Uh, I, I think, think of a midseason recruit in the form of <laughs> one uh, Daleb Kressel show up. He's from Botswana, I believe. <laughs> I I think even if Leendo kind of has an adjustment year, um, like you said, the math was conservative. These numbers look pretty stout. But I, yeah, I think I think they can do it. I'm swimming it all day. Next up, speaking of college men swimming. The Texas Longhorns are returning Krieger, Vines, and Zettel. That's Daniel Krieger, Braden Vines, and Alex Zettel for fifth years next year. So once again, even though we talked about Cal men earlier maintaining their dominance, do you see Texas getting over the hump and uh, winning back an NCAA title this year? Yin Yin, you go ahead. I got to check my emails. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm going to sink it because I think Texas loses more than Cal, even with the fifth years coming back, because I think they lose Drew Kibler. They lose Cameron. I I don't know how to say his last name. (laughs) Um, And Alvin Jung. And whereas I think Cal, I don't think they're, I think they lose Trent and Julian, but aside from that, they're not losing anyone else. That's that big. And Reese Whitley's coming back. And, um, Especially, we're not sure about Hugo Gonzalez, but if he comes back, I think they have an even bigger advantage. And I think they also have that relay advantage where they're a lot better with the sprint freestyle relays than Texas is, especially since Texas's best sprinters are all leaving except for Danny Krieger. And I just think there's a lot of moment, there's still a lot of momentum on Cal's side. And I just don't see Texas being. We love the momentum. Yeah, yeah. So I had to check my my emails, the Instagram inbox. We're trying to figure out if Hugo's coming back. I think if Hugo comes back, Cal wins. If Hugo does not come back, I think Texas wins. So I, I pick Cal by less than one Hugo, um, which means no Hugo, no win, and Texas wins. I think the, the sprinter is a fair point. I think Bjorn Seliger is going to have like an all-timer NCAA season. But, like, look at David Johnston and Luke Hobson. They're going to score 80 points in the distance events or 90 points in the distance events, and they'll find sprinters. They, they're they Texas. They've got so much talent. They've got such a good culture. I think they'll figure out the sprinters. Um, they've got a few kind of lesser-known guys from other countries, which is not something we normally see from Texas. They've got a Russian guy. Um, they've got another guy maybe from St. Lucia. Is that right? Um, I don't know. He's from somewhere else. That's not America. Uh, and and I, I just I think they'll figure out the sprints. And I think it's that close of a meet. I think Texas diving will have a bounce back here and that will be impactful, too. Um, so, Hugo, this is fully on you. Is Jordan Wendell ever coming back or is he, is he just like, you know, I was I was banned. looking into this the other day and there's been no progress on his um, proceedings with the FBI. So. I I have a hard time believing that he we will ever see him die for Texas again, but it's not impossible. Well, what is it impossible? No, he I, I, he's out of eligibility because yeah, this I was that so. last year was going to be his fifth oh, year, and he dove right, right. to burn the year of eligibility. Mm. So I don't know if he could get a waiver, a hardship waiver, if if it turns out, he, you know, if it comes back. Fully not guilty, no questions, whatever. I think maybe there's a chance the NCAA would give him some kind of a waiver, but um, on paper, he should be out of eligibility. I think regardless of that, I am swimming Texas winning next year. I think in 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 the past five, seven years, Texas will lose one year and they'll bounce. They'll come back and win the next year um, over Cal. They haven't lost two years in a row since 2012. 
I, since 2014, they haven't lost two NCAAs in a row. And so I think uh, everyone's going to continue to evolve. We've seen Carson Foster develop. Jake's, his brother, is going to be there scoring big in the IMs and breaststroke as well. Um, Jake's going to have a big year. With, with Braden there as well. Um, if he can really... With Braden Keith, with Braden Vines coming back, if he can swim up to his potential, which I don't think we've seen him do in like a full NCAA meet, um, he would be big in those events. All of these events are events Hugo will swim, which is why I'm bringing them up. But then I think, like Braden said, they're going to retool and everything else. They're Texas. And uh, I think they will get over the hump this year and edge Cal for a title. I think Braden Keith being there for Texas would cancel out Hugo Gonzalez's impact. <laughs> Guys, I appreciate it, but I graduated from high school many years ago, and my five-year clock has expired. I don't know. You th- you could probably get a waiver, at least a D2 <laughs> waiver, at the very least. <laughs> and last up today on Sink or Swim, we're keeping it with men's NCAA swimming. We're going to do this for both men and women comparing incoming freshman classes and who we think will score most through their NCAA career. But on the women's side, it was just so obvious that on paper, Stanford's class is the far and away number one headlined by three, I think, or four of our top five swimmers um, in the class of 2022, Claire Curzan at number one and Charlotte Hook number two. So Stanford's incoming freshman class looks sizzling uh and then the virginia women are also bringing in a class that is a very solid number two and then it kind of was everyone else and so it wasn't much of a of a comparison but on the men's side we are comparing stanford to nc state stanford is headlined by josh sikowski number three number sorry number two number three is liam custer number 11 zahir fawn and number 15, Andres Dupont Cabrera, Cabrera, my mistake. While NC State has number five, Michael Cotter, number eight, Lance Norris, and number 14, Quentin McCarty. Those are just the, the ranked recruits. Uh, so what do you guys think? Stanford or NC State to score the most as a class, as, as the class of 2022, during their NCAA career? I'm going to go back to the momentum well one more time. Um, I think Stanford on paper has the better class, but I think NC state, uh, will score more points. You know, I think Josh, uh, Zakowski has had a lot of really good training in high school. So I think he's probably closer to his peak than some of these other guys. Um, not that, you know, Michael Cotter and Lance Norris and some of these guys haven't, but it feels like NC state, the NC state guys have like a whole vibe going on there. Um, where they truly believe that they're going to be swimming for NCAA titles within two or three years, like team titles, the big title. Um, And I think that's going to play big. I think that's going to keep them focused in practice. Um, I, I just, I, NC state's guys feel like guys who work at NC state. They feel like the kind of guys who fit there. I think Kyle Ponsler is a, is a very high potential guy, even though he's not ranked. Um, And they just, they seem like the kind of guys who do well at NC State. And in Stanford, it's I may be hurting Stanford because we don't really know what Stanford's identity is now under their third year coaching staff. How many years have they been there? Second or third year? Second I or just, third year. Yeah. I just feel like we don't really know what Stanford's identity is as a program, what kind of athletes excel there, um, who their coaches are good at coaching and training. Um, so I'm, I'm going NC state just because it seems like a safer bet, but these are two very good classes and it'll be fun to kind of watch them duke it out. Yeah. I'm going to go with NC state as well, just cause I think they have had more recent success in yards. Like Michael Cotter, um, had a great year. Um, Quinton McCarty, I know at sectionals, um, this March, he dropped a lot of time, but like Stanford, a lot of their recruits like haven't gone best times recently. Like Liam Custer went fourteen fifty seven in the mile back in twenty twenty, and I don't think he's been there ever since. And Zukowski set most of his best times in twenty twenty one as well. And um, 
yeah and i just think like recency like just like in terms of like recent success nc state has the high upper hand i'm I'm jumping on the bandwagon i think nc state as well uh i with with the class coming in josh sikowski and liam custer made their announcements really exciting and they kind of set this precedent that this would be the new wave for Stanford and that they were going to kind of change that. And so if they do, that would be really exciting and I would love to see it. Um, But as we've seen, guys go to NC State and they develop into into these world-class NCAA champion caliber swimmers. And we just haven't seen Stanford on the men's side do that for the for the past five or ten years again we don't really know what their identity is but i think generally the idea of stanford as a university is that they get a lot of talent and they don't necessarily develop it as much as other teams do like what nc state done that's has coleman done at swim swam <laughs> com. you can send your hate mail um i think it's an interesting psychology you know there's it's two different scenarios, right? Like the the Stanford guys are coming in with sort of an attitude of, hey, we're we're making this program the Stanford it used to be again. We're gonna take over this program and Stanford is the future. The NC State guys are like, we've got some big guys in this program and we're just gonna get up on their shoulders and get over that line. Um, and and we've got the energy to do that. Like we're the missing pieces. Um and so whoever adapts better to those respective mentalities might be the ones who succeed. Yeah. So it'll be, it'll be really fun watching these two classes go at it for the next four years. I have one more sink or swim before we're done. Ooh, surprise sink or swim. Okay. Sink or swim. Yin Yin Lee is the greatest swim swim breakdown debut we have ever had. <laughs> debut yin yin came prepared she got on the zoom call and said i have notes on every single topic we're going to discuss and for that reason i'm swimming it i didn't want to be there like not know what to say i feel like i have that problem sometimes so you know i have to sink it i'm ranking yin yin's debut number two all time because barry revzin came in like he was in a spaceship and had some big old headphones on (laughs) and he just did the math and barry is my favorite person on earth so i'm gonna give barry the edge for now but (laughs) yin yin this was a solid debut i'm gonna call you number two all time thank you i will take that (laughs) all right and that with with that that's the Swim Swam Breakdown. Uh, tune in every week to the Swim Swam Breakdown for your week's news and swimming.